All right, folks, you don't know this on the other side of the camera, but we have filmed this video four different times and we've had everything technological that could possibly go wrong in the process happen to us. So this must be a really important video with really important knowledge, right? Right. We're talking about one of boxing's greatest heavyweight champions of all time, Joe Lewis. And today we're gonna to discuss his book, How to Box, published in 1948. We're gonna talk about some of the differences and how boxing was approached back then. And we're gonna talk about some of the absolute gems and wisdom hidden in these pages so that you can have success when you fight. For the uninitiated, I'm gonna let the forward of this book do the talking for us. It says, Joe Lewis is the greatest boxing champion of all times. By June 1948, when this book was written, he had been heavyweight champion of the world for 11 years, setting an all-time record. During these 11 years, he has been the idol of the sports world. He has defended his title 23 times, always exemplifying true sportsmanship. He has met all aspirants and even given worthy ones a second chance at his title. So that gives you a little window into who Joe Lewis is. And it's really, really fascinating listening to a book by Joe. Uh, it's interesting him framing he has met all aspirants and even given worthy ones a second chance to win his title. Because I know from reading a bunch of sports writers opinions in old ring magazines that they used to talk about Joe Lewis's bum of the month club, where he would fight a bunch of people and a bunch of athletes that they didn't consider worthy of fighting for the heavyweight title. But I think this ends up being a lot like the Klitschko era where Joe Lewis met everybody that he could have fought. He gave everybody a chance. And if you're gonna hang around that long and you're gonna defend your title that frequently, you're gonna have to kind of dig a little bit deeper to find challengers that maybe you can market or find people that you haven't fought many times before. Joe Lewis's first chapter is titled Mind Discipline. And honestly, the first two paragraphs of this are full of gems and I'm gonna read them to you in their entirety. From childhood, it is necessary to train your mind with clean thoughts, free of all hatreds and fears. If not, you will be seriously hampered in your effort to learn to box. Blood pressure, nerve tension, and other bodily conditions are harmfully affected by a bad mental attitude. Anger kept in your heart burns up your nerves and your energy, which are both important in conditioning. The strict discipline needed in training will require giving up many things, ease, comfort, and all forms of dissipation. You must learn to follow rules and regulations and to always respect the other fellow. You must also be able to take reverses and not become sour. You must become more tolerant and more patient than all others. And above all, you must have the will and the determination to succeed. This is spectacular advice to start off a book on how to box because whether you're trying to become an excellent boxer, whether you're trying to just become an excellent person, that's the structure you should adhere to. As we chisel through the book, we're always gonna run into things that show its age, that are a sign of the times. Uh, one of the fun things that we run into really, really quick here is Joe Lewis talking about candy. He says, candy is also very good because of its sugar content. Carbohydrates such as candy, bread, cereals, and sugar produce energy. While he's not wrong here, that's fascinating advice because that's not the way that most modern nutritionists or athletes would approach their diet. He's correct, carbohydrates are where you get your short-term energy from, but it's interesting ever just seeing uh, the line, candy is also very good. While talking about training, Joe Lewis makes a point, and I agree with, to say there should be absolutely no smoking or alcoholic beverages allowed in camp. He also has a suggestion here that I'm sure my wife will love that says, it is necessary to get 10 hours of sleep each night. This reminds me of an interview with Khabib, former UFC champion from a couple years ago, where he's being interviewed and he's asked how he sustains such a relentless and rigorous training regimen. And he says he sleeps 10 hours a night 
and he takes a nap after his morning workout every day. And this is good knowledge. You can sit here and you can talk about supplements and ice baths and stretching, but at the end of the day, the best way for you to recover is at rest. That's when your body does its soft tissue recovery and regeneration. So getting lots of sleep is something that's gonna help you recover when you're putting your body through a tough camp. In Joe's chapter, talking about boxing equipment, he references the wall pulleys. Now, the wall pulleys are something we don't see much of nowadays, but if you go back and you look at footage of Joe and you look at footage of Jack Dempsey and a lot of the other old timers, they have this mechanism where it's two uh, handles attached to cables anchored to a wall. These wall pulleys, they shadow box and they do some various calisthenic exercises while facing them. So the resistance doesn't come while extending the arm, the resistance comes while returning the arm. And now I have a theory that this is one of the reasons why a lot of the old school guys could get away without the modern and contemporary kind of strength training that most boxers nowadays have. Because when they're using the wall pulleys, they're balancing out this movement. They're not only training those pushing and punching muscles, they're also training those pulling and postural muscles. He goes on to say, the pulley weights are very good to loosen and stretch all of the muscles of the body. Shadow box facing the pulleys according to a three minute round routine. This perfectly balances out your three minute round routine you do while shadow boxing, hitting the bag or sparring. Continuing talking about equipment, Joe Lewis also says, headgear for boxers is used in training to prevent injuries to the eyes and ears. Notice he doesn't say to prevent concussions, to prevent knockouts or knockdowns. And I agree with this. I actually think that headgear is really important so that you don't bang heads together, you don't get cauliflower ear, you don't cut up your cheeks or your nose, you don't accidentally headbutt the other person. But I think it makes you more likely to get knocked out or get a concussion because it makes your head heavier and it makes your head a bigger target and it creates a longer radius, a longer lever off of the axis that your head spins on when somebody hits you. When Joe says protect the ears, it reminds me of a fascinating little anecdote from the old time boxers. The way you used to be able to tell a wrestler from a boxer back in the 20s and 30s and 40s was because wrestlers had cauliflower on both ears and boxers only had cauliflower on their lead ear because that's where they'd be getting hit and that's where they'd be grappling and wrestling. In the chapter titled Proper Stance, Joe says, the position of the feet should be directly under the body at medium distance apart. This position gives you balance. Now, this is different from the wide, dynamic, athletic stance that you see from a lot of modern fighters. And this is because the old school guys didn't have those rubber soled shoes. They frequently were boxing in leather soled shoes. And because of that, they didn't have as much traction to drive, almost like each step was a jump and instead they would step and slide or shuffle or pendulum step their way around the ring. Changes in boxing equipment are the biggest reason why modern boxing looks different from old school boxing. The old school guys had to be movers, they had to be mobile because they couldn't dig into the ground, explode out of stance the way that modern fighters do because the shoes are different. Elaborating on stance, Joe says, the head should have no singular action of its own. It works along with the body. The chin should always be pinned down to the chest bone. Any other position of the chin will cause unnecessary tiredness and will leave you open for your opponent's blow. This is something that's hard to see from the outside, but once you settle into that boxing stance, your hips, your shoulders, and your head all stay in that alignment. Boxing, when done perfectly and correctly, is anti-rotational and you wanna be bracing through your torso and your neck and your spine. You don't want that head flopping and looking all over the place. That's gonna get you in trouble and the old timers knew that. Talking about footwork, Joe says, clever footwork does not mean hopping and jumping around as this will put you off balance and the slightest blow will upset you. The purpose of clever footwork is to give your opponent false leads and to tire him by making him hit at the wrong target. It also carries you out of danger when hurt. It's important in boxing to recognize that more is not more and less is not more. Every single thing has a sweet spot, a Goldilocks zone that you should be in. And when you're moving your feet, you don't just wanna bounce around to bounce around. You're not just moving to move. That's gonna get you in a bad spot. You're moving with purpose. 
Joe's hidden more knowledge in his section about footwork, and he says, you should always move in the opposite direction of your opponent's strongest and best blow, never crossing your feet and always be in a position to defend yourself or to attack your opponent. Something I say to my boxers that kind of sounds like nonsense is, it's better to be in a defensible position, in a position to need to be defensible, than to rush anywhere. And this is true. I would rather get caught with a glancing shot in a position to absorb and dissipate that force than rush somewhere and get clobbered when I'm not in a position to absorb and dissipate the damage from that punch. Additionally, Joe talks about circling away from your opponent's power side hand. Whenever a coach has an athlete fighting a southpaw, they always harp on this. They say, get lead foot dominance, move away from his left cross. And I love the way that in that situation, coaches think positionally first. That is the first thing in the order of operations. But then this all goes out the window in a close exchange against another orthodox fighter. They let them fight on the line. They let them drift to their left. They let them enter into the cross lane and get stuck there, moving into their opponent's power side hand. The old school knowledge, as Joe knew, says move away from your opponent's best punch. At the amateur level, that usually means you gotta get comfortable moving to your right side. I've been doing this for over two decades now, and it astonishes me how many boxers I can handily outspar, or handily outwork, or handily handicap just by moving to my right, moving over their left shoulder. Don't get stuck in that trap. If you're an orthodox fighter, you should be able to move to your right and box successfully, have access to all of your techniques, just like the old school guys. It's always fascinating when old school advice contradicts the way that you currently do something, and you kind of have to dissect what that is and what causes that. So right here, Joe says, when wrapping the hands, the bandage should never be placed between the fingers as this will spread the bones of the hand. That's interesting. As somebody who currently has a hand injury, um, I've always wrapped between my fingers. I don't think I've ever met a high level boxer that doesn't wrap between their fingers, but Joe suggests not to do it. I wonder if this is just because, again, just like the shoes or the gloves, of a difference in material. I wonder if the bandages used to be thicker, if they maybe used to be more of a fabric material instead of a gauze, and because of that, they would spread the bones of the hand apart and get you into trouble. Though certainly, it might be worth me practicing, trying something new to see if I can figure out a way to wrap my hands and keep me safe. Joe also says, whilst talking about equipment, there are four sets of gloves used by a boxer. The 14 ounce glove, which is used in training and exhibitions, the light glove used for punching the light bag, the heavy gloves for punching the heavy bag, and six ounce gloves for actual fighting. Some takeaways from that, standard sparring gloves today are 16s, but in his day, the 14 ounce gloves were used in training, sparring, and exhibitions. The light glove is used for punching the light bag. I've seen these gloves. These light gloves uh, usually look almost like an MMA glove. And terminology, when old school boxers refer to the light bag, they're referring to either the speed bag or the double-ended bag. Next, he says heavy gloves for punching the heavy bag, and these are the gloves in the picture right here. I also have a wonderful pair from Rival Boxing that I really like, and they really let you feel how you're making contact on a target so that you can punch with correct technique and with the correct knuckles. And then, of course, let's always respect the old timers. Joe Lewis was fighting at heavyweight in six ounce gloves. And that should really let you know just how different the game is because modern heavyweights are usually wearing tens. Reading through this, Joe Lewis really had a great understanding of his cardio, of his road work. Uh, when I'm reading through this, he talks about sprint training, he talks about interval training, he talks about staying in the appropriate heart rate zone, staying in aerobic, not anaerobic zone while you're doing your cardio. I'm just gonna read this to you verbatim because it's gold and very contemporary. Joe says, Road work is very good for strengthening the legs, increasing lung power, and strengthening the heart. However, it should not be overdone, as it will then do more harm than good. Never run until you become too tired or exhausted. It is best to maintain a steady pace in your road runs, breathing deeply and evenly. 
Many boxers run the same length of time as they box, resting one minute between each three minute running session. To sharpen your mind, you should sprint for 200 yards, then walk for 100 yards to regain your measured steady breathing before sprinting again. You should never run for at least three or four hours after eating. When walking or running, you should carry a small, very soft rubber ball in each hand and squeeze them as they will aid in strengthening the muscles of the fingers and the wrists. That last bit of knowledge is a fun little tidbit from Joe himself, more old school tricks. Continuing talking about training, Joe says, shadow boxing is used to perfect boxing skill and to acquire ring form. Shadow box just as you would actually box, always punching hard and timing yourself to three minute rounds. Joe and I are in agreement about that. I think shadow boxing, while it can be used in a variety of ways, predominantly should be used to replicate a fight, to replicate the context, the exchanges, and the situations you'll end up in a fight at fight pace. Joe also advocates for sparring at the end of your training while you're fatigued. He says, finish your training period by boxing three or four rounds and if possible with different sparring partners, trying to learn something from each partner. Trying to learn something from each partner. We're not giving up brain cells for free. We're trying to educate ourselves. We're trying to improve our skills. My wife left me a note so that I wouldn't forget like we always forget when we're filming these. Please give us a like and subscribe. It really, really helps us grow our channel. And if you want to, comment down below if there are any other boxing or martial arts books you'd like me to check out and give my insight on in the future. Continuing about training, Joe says once again, while training, you should sleep at least 10 hours daily. It's a long time for most busy modern folks. He also says to drink water, but never with meals. I'm not sure the reasoning behind that, but if it was good enough for Joe, maybe it's worth a try. He says, if you're trying to lose weight, you should omit all starches. That's good advice. Starches are carbohydrates. Carbohydrates make you hold on to water. <laughs> and then he has this very funny line here that Rocky Marciano also talks about in his book, where he says, after exercising, lie down with all clothes off for 20 minutes until thoroughly dry. Uh, doing all my training in a public gym, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to try this one out, but I've had two great former heavyweight champions make this suggestion, that after your training you should lie down naked. Rocky Marciano makes a point to say you should keep your socks on, which is strange, uh, for 20 minutes until you stop sweating, until you're completely dry. Uh, I don't know how you would go about testing this, but I'd love somebody to find a way to do a study on it and find out if there is value on just immediately and completely resting following strenuous exercise. Sounds like a task for Huberman. Yeah, get Andrew Huberman in here. <laughs> Just another funny line in here from Joe, another line that might date the book a little bit. Joe says, I guess as a kid, I thought skipping the rope was kind of for sissies. Now I know it's a good exercise for anybody. <laughs> when talking about punch mechanics, once again, there's kind of a vocab difference in how he identifies punches versus how we identify punches in the modern era. He calls what we would call the right hook, the right cross. So this curving punch, you rotate with your rear side, coming and hitting something on your left side, he refers to as a cross. And he refers to what we would call a cross as the right straight. Striking one blow and following it up by another blow is called the one two. This is another kind of vocab difference. Whereas in the modern era, we refer to the one-two as a fast jab cross. Joe says that the one-two is just two punches in quick succession. He even makes a point to say, many experts say the one-two is delivered with the same hand, i.e. a straight or left to the jaw, then to the body or vice versa. Just some more vocab difference as we travel through time here. In the chapter on defense, Joe includes sidestepping and fainting as part of your defenses. Also, fascinatingly, when talking about blocking, Joe says, if your opponent should lead with a blow to the chin, use your shoulder to block it by dropping your arm and turning your body enough so that your shoulder will receive the blow. And that's fascinating. And again, I believe 
an artifact of the equipment that he used. With those teeny tiny gloves, blocking with the back of your hand or your forearm was a tough ask. There's a good chance you're gonna injure your hand and it's just a small thing to shield yourself with. So the shoulder roll wasn't its own separate technique. That was the expectation for how you blocked, especially on that lead side. Also in the chapter on defense, Joe Lewis makes a point to talk about baiting punches, saying, drawing is used when you want your opponent to deliver a specific blow. By leaving that particular part of your body momentarily exposed, this is done to create an opening for your attack. Smart tactics. When talking about the rules of boxing and fouls in boxing, I find it interesting that I see something I've never seen before. I see this. It is a foul to use the pivot, a blow delivered by swinging completely around. I think that this is what we would call like a spinning back fist in MMA or in Muay Thai. And it's interesting that obviously I know that's illegal in the modern era, but I've never heard it called a pivot before. So a pivot punch is a spinning back fist. Something to learn. Joe Lewis's final chapter titled Come Out Fighting is full of wisdom and little nuggets of knowledge in here. And I'm gonna read you a couple excerpts in their entirety. When stepping into the ring, you should be relaxed and know that you are in the best physical condition possible. Always try to use your head and never become excited. Don't underrate your opponent, but have self-confidence knowing that you are just as tough as he is. Remember to keep your balance at all times as it is very easy to be knocked out when off balance. Let each punch count and always punch through and not at your object. Since each opponent has a different style, it is necessary to feel him out and discover which blows will affect him more than others. Remember, every blow is not a knockout blow, but it can be just as effective because each blow can be used to weaken your opponent so that he will only need one more blow to finish him. And Joe Lewis's conclusion in his wonderful book, How to Box is, remember, Boxing is a sport in which two athletes are trying to outwit each other by using their muscles. But also remember to respect your opponent and play fair. So break clean and come out fighting. Break clean and come out fighting sounds just like Joe Lewis's version of, so you can have success when you fight.